Better than getting vermin, Isabel said, coloring her kitchen table a cheerful orange. All the shelters got to do that. Oh, Early said, how many shelters have you stayed in? Isabel paused and looked at the ceiling, counting on her fingers. Early liked the way she took the time to make her point, whatever it might be. Eight, she said, and nodded her head dramatically. And that is a lot of moving, she added. Yeah, Early said, sure is. Time for a home, she grinned. I like you, Isabel said. Her head on one side. You're my kind of girl. Want to be best shelter friends for as long as we're both here? Yeah, Early said again. She hadn't smiled this much in a long time. When the tutoring room closed that day, all four kids continued talking on their way up the stairs. Catch you later, Isabel said as she and her brother headed up on, on up to their room. Later, Early said, jerking her chin upward in a Chris got lots to do gesture. Velma was seated at one of the long tables, sewing a button on the neck of her winter coat. After watching the kids, she nodded and smiled. Told her, she muttered to herself, that kid's gone places. Gonna help her mama, she said. Kids, they got lots confu they got less confusion in their brains. A woman who said who was new to the shelter looked over. Why did you say? Who's that? She said, asked. Vilma looked over at the woman, noticed she had nice sneakers and a fancy jacket on, and shrugged. Cover. From the Middle English, covering and Latin, cuperire. Verb. To hide, protect, or conceal. To place something over or around an object or living thing so as to shield from danger. To guard from attack. Noun, something that shelters or disguises, a situation providing protection from enemies, the front or back of the binding of a book. Cover, after a week of sun and wispy clouds, the snow has started again. A wet, heavy white that covered cars, streetlights, hoods, and hats. It fell without wind to carry it. The flakes were so dense that it was hard to see far. Early had a miserable time rousing some the next morning, but finally got the three of them dressed, fed, and onto the train to Harold Washington. How many days are you going to make us do this, Early Pearl? Some asked, her voice grumpy. I love you doing research, and I love all your plans, but this is a long trip for me and Juby every day. I'm afraid I fell asleep in the corner of the children's library yesterday when he was playing, and the librarian, that nice Mr. Tumble, woke me and asked if I was okay. I said, no. Would you be okay if you lost your partner, all your money, and your home? Guess I should have smiled and said yes, but I'm getting too worn out to do that these days. Early looked at her mother's face. She had pockets under her eyes, like the skin had gotten tired of holding on in the last few weeks, like life was rushing her away from being young. Young. Some. Early patted her arm gently. Mr. Wave and I are finding out good stuff. We're getting someplace. We're going to find Dash. And Mr. John, the tutor in our shelter, really likes my ideas. He's all excited about working on them. We got things happening. So we all need to hold fast. Just put your dad telling you what to do and you'll feel stronger. It didn't work. Some covered her eyes with one hand and sat still, but her mouth was crying. Early and Juby both looked at her and people on the train looked too. Then some said softly, patting her eyes with the end of her scarf, I'm so sorry. I really am. I'm trying. I just feel lost. I need Dad so badly. Guess I never realized how empty life could get without him, but I'm trying. Early didn't say any more and squeezed her mother's hand. Juby leaned his aunt head against her on the other side. You got us and we'll be good, he said. I won't whine no more. Some gave him a sad smile. You mean any more? Any more, chirped Juby. I gotta be strong, Early thought to herself. Strong enough for three, just like Dash was strong enough for four. She gazed out, not really paying attention to what she saw. A boy carried a puppy across the street. A school bus stopped to pick up kids waiting on a corner in front of another big shelter, which some had pointed out to Early the other day. And then Early saw a man in a big jacket, his shoulders hunched, walked from between two buildings, limping. He moved slowly toward the line of kids. The side of his face, it looked just like Dash. Dash, Dash, Dash. 
This flash seen from a moving chain, an impression lasting only a second, shot her bolt upright in her seat. She glanced at Sum, wondering if she should say something. Sum's eyes were closed. Juby was busy playing with this truck. He muttered, driving it back and forth on his leg. No early thoughts. I've been thinking of Dad so much that now I'm seeing him. I just am just seeing what I want to see, inventing things. Early squeezed her eyes shut for a moment, forcing herself to concentrate on the sound of the train grinding over the tracks, metal on metal. She opened her eyes to see a boarded up building they'd noticed before, one with a red roof, fly by outside the train window. This morning, the roof had a gentle mound of white on top of its chimney and looked promising beneath the snow. The train screeched at a stop at Harold Washington. Stepping out onto the cold platform with her silent mother and brother, she felt painfully alone. Cover. Mr. Wave wasn't there this morning. Early peeked through the glass of the limited access room, but was, was afraid to enter it on her own. She knew it was no good trying to get information out of Mr. Pincer or the lady with the blue vein. But Mr. All slept? Al? If she could spot him coming or going, she knew he had something to tell her. He'd had that eager look on his face and Mr. Prinzer had stopped him. Pulling off her coat, she sat down at one of the tables for the general public and opened her notebook. She found a seat near the open stacks, one partly hidden by books but with a clear view of the front desk and staff only door. She pulled a few thick books out a nearby shelf and made herself a little wall. She opened one of the books as if reading and slunk down in her chair. A man with a bow tie and crooked glasses went into the limited access room. Next, a woman with a fur collar on her coat. Now two students who looked about the same age as Mr. John. Then Mr. Pinter appeared from nowhere. Oh no. Early slid even lower. The supervisor was walking next to a man who resembled a large chimpanzee, all fuzziness and a big, heavy forehead. It was difficult to look away. Luckily, Mr. Pincer seemed just as fascinated by him. They had disappeared through the staff-only door. It was already after 10 and Early was losing hope. She'd have to meet some and Juby in time to get back to the shelter for lunch. And then whoosh, Mr. Allslip strode past, pushing a cart of books. Psst, Mr. Allslip. She whispered as she hurried by. He glanced in her direction and his eyes flickered with recognition and something else. Was it fear? He wriggled his shoulders as if they could hide him and kept moving. Early thought he had jerked his head to the right. She followed trotting after his car as it zoomed down a long straight corridor of books. People she realized had rhythms too, unique ways of behaving and talking. If she could read Mr. Alslip's rhythm, why, what would they tell her? I can't talk to you, was the first thing he whispered. This is dangerous stuff, very dangerous. And if I'm seen talking to you, I'll be fired and, and maybe killed. We might both be, he squeaked. What? Early whisper back. Are you kidding? Killed? The word was a dreadful stony sound and it felt even wrong to say it. Mr. Alsop was still moving quickly, looking on all sides, pausing, turning a corner, rolling his cart further and further away from the office at the center of the floor. Finally, he stopped at a U-shaped study area with heavy chairs and a wraparound shelf for a table. You wait here, he ordered. Duck under, pull a chair close, and we'll park the cart in front. There, you're gone. What would some say, early wonder, but she already knew. Are you crazy? Hiding in a fairway part of the sixth floor with a man you don't know? The thing was, it was now or maybe never, and she needed to ask some questions. Early nodded. He scurried a few steps away, paused to listen, and hurried back, his shoes making a shree shree sound on the bare floors. We've got to whisper, he began, dropping into a chair on the other side of the book cart. Geez, my heart is pounding, he paused, one hand on his chest. This whole thing is nuts. Sorry about frightening you, but it's a dangerous time. He took a deep breath and blew it out in puffs, as if making invisible smoke rings. That's okay. Thanks for talking to me, early whispered. Mr. Alslip dusted off his shoes, rubbing one foot at a time on the back of his pant legs, which seemed to calm him. Actually, I was hoping you'd come back to the library. You're a brave kid, and there are things I want to tell you. 
First, your dad didn't do anything wrong. At least, I don't think so. And if something happens to me and I disappear too, at least you'll know the truth or more accurately what I can tell you. Sometimes it's hard to say what's true and what's not, especially when no one leaves prints. Hey, get it? Mr. Alslip glanced at early. A foot and a book can both leave a print through the number, th- numbers to thing. Sorry, can't help myself. Are you the guy my father called Al, she asked, the guy who liked playing games with him? That's me, he said. I knew it. Early crowed in a loud whisper. Mr. Printer told the police there's no Al here and that Mr. Lyman scrub doesn't exist. Really, Al said, his whiskers twitching. Lovely. Good to know he's watching my back. Early paused. So you're saying Mr. Printer is a part of all this too? No, well... Maybe, but not as far as Dash knew, at least I think. Forget I say that. Okay, let's stick to the skinny. Here's how your father and I fell into all this. One day, a man approached me in the stacks where I was shelving books. He gave me his card, which said Lyman Scrub Bookseller. Early nodded. What was the skinny? He explained that he needed two reliable pages who wanted to make a bit of money and were coming up in the library world. Yes, I already know this. That showed us. Early interrupted worry that he wouldn't finish before someone found them. How do you have any idea what I'm going to say? Al snapped, his nose and chin now twitching independently. A rare feat on one face. Sorry, Early whispered. Go on. This scrub fellow explained that he worked with some people from the New York City area whose job was to store, pack, and then sell unwanted estate donations. Donations. Some of them junk, you know, old books that no one could want. Early nodded, thinking that the way her father talked about out-of-print books made them glow as if they were objects deserving respect. This man was no dash. Al was now pulling busily on his mustache. So we did the job, each taking on separate parts of it. I'm living in my brother's house right now and didn't want to give the address, so your father got the cards at his apartment and I picked them up, along with a list of what was inside. I delivered them to an address in Marquette Park, one I wasn't supposed to tell your father. Early night again, this was a beat, all right. She could feel what was coming. It sounds like you thought there was something suspicious about the whole business from the start, she said. Too bad. I'm just a more cautious fellow than your father. More to hide. And don't drop snippy hints with me, young lady. I don't have to tell you a thing, you know. Sorry. Please go on, Early said. Could guilt and fear be parts of the same rhythm? Mr. Scrub paid us generously, instructing me to give your father his share after each pickup. And then one evening when I came by, Dash told me that he had kept one of the books for you kids. He said he paid more than enough for it, having checked on its value and put a star next to it on the list. I had the box in my arms. Setting it down, I asked, you think it? You think that's a good idea? Your father shrugged off any worries, explaining to me that he was just making the process easier for Mr. Scrub. He gave me a small envelope with the book for money for the book, and asked me to give it to the people who received the box when I dropped it off. Here's the part I'm feeling like I want you to know. I didn't give the money to the guys who took the delivery. They were big men, looking kind of rough, and I was afraid. I could picture them punching me in the nose before I'd even had a chance to explain. And seriously, all you have to do is come near my nose, and it hurts. Old injury. So I never told Dash that I'd taken the envelope home, although I never meant to. Time went by and I stuffed it in a drawer. I convinced myself that Dash was right. No one would mind, and I explained I'd forgotten it if anyone asked about the missing book. A couple of weeks passed, nothing. We processed more books of books. Then one of the guys from the warehouse called my cell phone early one morning and asked if I was a man who had gone through the box of books, the one with the star on the list. I said no, that had been my colleague Dash Pearl, and something in his voice just got me scared. I didn't say a word either about the missing book or the money Dash had handed me to give them. I know, I know, I should have.